Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we are grateful and thankful for this wonderful privilege that is ours to come together to worship you in a corporate way. We give you all the praise, the honor, the glory, because only you and you alone deserve our worship. We confess our many sins before you, Lord, we pray that you'd forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, God, as I stand to proclaim your word, I pray for a fresh anointing, a fresh enablement, a fresh empowerment of your Holy Spirit. Use me today so that everything that I say and everything that I do will only be said and only be done so that you might receive the glory. Cancel out every plan and schemes of the enemy. Have your way, Lord, in us, through us, and among us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, this indeed is the day the Lord has made. We ought to rejoice and be glad in it. How many of you are glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Let me honor, certainly honor the shepherd of this, of this flock, the pastor of this church, uh, my good friend, Pastor Conway Edwards, certainly to Pastor Matt, to all of the staff of this wonderful church, and to each of us, brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to have been invited by your pastor to come and share with you on today. You know, the Bible tells us in Jeremiah 3.15, I will give you pastors after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. May I remind you that your pastor is God's personal gift to you. And it has been suggested that the quality of the gift that is given says something about the regard of the, of the, of the person who gave the gift for the person who receives it. And if that be true, God must think a whole lot of you because of the wonderful gift that he has get, blessed you with in <laughs> Pastor, Con, Pastor Edward. Now, I told the church last night that it's been about 16 months since I preached, uh, probably le less than four or five times that I preached to a live audience. So I'm sitting here looking at you, and I don't know how to feel <laughs> because I have been preaching to a camera uh, for 16, 17 months. I've had to create my own energy, nobody to help me, <laughs> and so I don't know. I don't know. I don't. I don't know what to do with myself as I sit here, stand here rather, and look at you today. So I'm still trying to get my preaching legs back under me <laughs> of actually preaching to people <laughs> in person, and so I'm grateful to your pastor just for. <laughs> giving me this opportunity to experience preaching to people again. <laughs> there is a word that I'd like to share with you. I won't be very long today. It's found in the epistle to the Philippians, Philippians chapter 4. I want you to turn to Philippians chapter 4, and I want you to look at verses 10 through 13. Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. 13. Now I'm reading from the King James, uh, rather the New King James Bible, and I'd like to ask if you don't mind that you would stand with me as I read the Word of God. I told the church last night, so I guess I'll tell you there's nothing necessarily spiritual about standing when the Bible is being read, but if nothing else, it gets the blood running warmer in your veins, and regardless of what happens this morning, when I go back home, I can tell everybody truthfully I stood them up. I had them on their feet. <laughs> Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 10. Here's how my Bible reads. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ 
who strengthens me. For I have learned, in whatever state I am, to be content. I, I have learned, in whatever state I am, to be content. Look at your neighbor and t smile at him and tell him, I choose to be happy. That's what I want to talk about. You may be seated. I choose to be happy. Several years ago, Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones came out with a song that says, I can't get no satisfaction in this world anymore. The words of that song were written by one who had enjoyed wealth, success, and the pleasures of life. And when the smoke had cleared and the dust had settled, at the end of the day, he came to the conclusion that he couldn't get no satisfaction in this world. The words of this song, friends, are reminiscent of an age of people who are searching for happiness, searching for contentment, searching for a sense of satisfaction. But brothers and sisters, the problem is that this world does not afford the human heart the happiness, the contentment, and the satisfaction for which we are seeking. The problem with some is that they are seeking happiness and satisfaction by turning to all the wrong sources. Some seek for a sense of fulfillment through materialism, but do not find it. Others seek for joy through sexual prowess, but only end up with fleeting pleasures and bitter disappointments. And others seek for a sense of fulfillment by obtaining positions of power in corporations or by exercising excessive control in their own families and do not find it. And I to look into all of those sources trying to find happiness and trying to find a sense of contentment. They come to the same conclusion as did Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones. They can't get no satisfaction in this world anymore. I like the words that Abraham Lincoln, that Abraham Lincoln used, who himself experienced many dark and dismal days in his own life. He said, most people are about as happy as they choose to be. I discovered this quote while reading a book co-authored by Drs. Frank Minareth and Paul Meyer, and the book is, an, is appropriately entitled, Happiness is a Choice. And in this book, these two Christian psychiatrists come to, came to, to, to the conclusion that if one is going to be healed and cured of the causes and symptoms of depression and unhappiness, they must choose to be happy. I couldn't agree with those men more. Many people are unhappy because, believe it or not, they have chosen to be. And I know that some would disagree with my premise and say that our sense of happiness and contentment is not merely a matter of one's conscious choice, but that it is a culmination of one's outer circumstances. But what I've come to suggest in this message this morning is that you can be happy regardless of your circumstances. And that is the point that Paul is trying to make to us as he writes this little message, this little letter to the saints in Philippi. And when you get a chance, I encourage you to read Paul's letter to the Philippians. There's only four chapters and in this little, uh, this little book, this little letter, it's kind of like Paul's little thank you note. That he writes them a note of appreciation for how they had over and over again been so supportive of meeting his physical and ministerial needs. And so I encourage you to read it because over and over again, interestingly, you will discover that Paul admonishes the Philippian believers to be happy, to have joy, to rejoice. Over and over again, a common theme, rejoice, rejoice. But I find that rather interesting because when Paul wrote this letter, he was facing less than ideal circumstances in his own life. When Paul wrote his letter to this letter to the Philippians, Paul was not in a five-star hotel. When he wrote this letter, friends, he was not on a beach 
drinking a mimosa. But no, Paul, when he wrote this letter, was in a Roman prison. His freedom had been taken away. He's been incarcerated. And while facing less than ideal circumstances in his own life, Paul over and over again admonishes the believers in Philippi to rejoice, to have joy, to be happy. And I wondered why, how Paul could encourage them to have joy when he himself was facing less than ideal circumstances. And I've come to the conclusion that Paul understood that I can admonish you to have joy because genuine Christian joy is not based on one's outward environment or outward circumstances, but genuine joy emanates from knowing that you have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I've come to talk to somebody today that because you made up your mind that you are not going to be happy until all of the circumstances of your life are ideal, that you're not going to be happy until all the stars of your life line up perfectly. Well, you're going to be unhappy for a long time if you're waiting on that to happen. But I want to tell you today that real joy, real happiness is not dependent on our happenings, but it really comes from knowing that we have a relationship with the Lord. And so let me share with you let me share with you just a couple of movements in this little passage, and I'll make some comments and soon be in my seat. I think that Paul is teaching us some valuable lessons, some practical lessons. Here's one. He's teaching us, first of all, that, that you need to know, if you're going to be happy, you need to know that your sufficiency is in the Savior. Your sense of sufficiency is in the Savior. Listen to what he said in verse 11. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Now, Paul, Paul has been commending, he's commending the Philippian believers for how they had been faithfully uh, supplying and meeting his physical uh, monetary ministerial needs over and over again. And this is one of the poorest churches in the New Testament, but they were one of the most generous churches because over and over again, they had met Paul's financial ministerial needs. And what Paul is saying in verse 11, when he says, not that I speak in regard to need, but I've learned whatever state I am to be content. He said, I'm not writing this to you because I'm trying to get another offering from you. He says, no, 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 don't misunderstand me. He says, for I have learned, and I've, I've learned, I've learned. That word learned means to acquire the habit of. I, I, have, I have come to the knowledge of. Uh, it, it is a term that was used by uh, the, the mystic religious, some mystic religions uh, as, a, as, an, as a secret initiation formula that if one learned as the secret initiation formula then one would be admitted into that mystic religious circle Paul Christianizes this term and says in essence I have learned the secret of contentment my life and my many experiences have taught me how to be content. Can the church say content? That word content is an interesting word. It was used by the Stoic philosophers. It literally means self-sufficient, self-sufficient, or not needing the aid of one's outward environment in order to determine a sense of happiness and contentment. Well, what Paul does here, he Christianizes this Stoic idea and says, you are right. I don't need my outward circumstances to help me to determine a sense of contentment. But, 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 but unlike you Stoics who are self-sufficient, Paul says, I am rather Christ-sufficient because I have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. He has taught me the secret of being contented and of being happy. Friends, I want to tell you today that, it's, that real genuine joy and happiness and contentment is kind of like the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat. A thermometer, a th thermometer is controlled by the condition of the room. If you walk into the room and the room is hot, the mercury rises. If the room is cold, the mercury falls because a thermometer 
is controlled by the environment that it's in. On the other hand, a thermostat is not controlled by the environment, but rather it regulates the temperature of the room. And what Paul is trying to teach us today is that, is that we ought not have a thermometer joy, a joy that says I'm happy and I have joy if my circumstances are ideal. I, I, I'm happy if I drive the right car. I'm happy if I have the right job. I'm happy if I make the right money. No, but when you walk with Christ a while and when you've matured in your faith, you don't practice a thermometer joy, but rather you practice a thermostatic joy that says, I'm happy regardless of my circumstances. I may not live in the house that I want to live right now, but I'm happy in my apartment. I may not drive the car I want to drive right now, but I'm happy on the bus stop. I may not eat T-bone steaks every day, but I'm happy eating peanut butter and jelly because my happiness does not come from my circumstances. It comes from my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me talk to some single Christian. Stop going around moping and complaining. They won't nobody take me. I can't have a day. Listen, baby, go get your hair done, get your nails done, get your toes done. Buy yourself a new dress and take your own self out. Because your happiness should not come from whether or not you have a man or woman in your life. It will come from knowing that you have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when you understand that your sufficiency, your sense of contentment is in the Savior, not in your circumstances, then it tells me that you have more than likely matriculated at two of, of the major universities of life. There are two major universities, two schools, I like to call them, in this text. I'll call the first school the University of Prosperity. In verse 12, Paul says, I know how to abound. That word abound means to increase. He says, everywhere and in all things, I've learned to be full, to be full. He says, he says, listen, I know how to abound, and I know what it means to be full because I've been to the university of prosperity. I know what it's like, Paul says, to have plenty of food on my table and plenty of money in my pocket because I've been to the university of prosperity. I, I, I came from an influential background. I came from an affluent family. I was educated at the finest universities of my day, Paul says, because I've been to the university of prosperity. But, but I didn't allow my prosperity to cause me to lose or not have a healthy dependence on God. Someone has rightly suggested that prosperity has done more to damage some believers than adversity. Because when some of us are blessed to prosper, it goes to our heads. We walk around with our noses in the air. Your nose is so far in the air until if it rained, you would drown. Oh, and the more we, the more stuff we acquire for some of us, the less we feel we need to go to church, the less we feel we need God in our lives. But can I tell you something? If, if anybody ought to be in church and all of us regardless of our race ought to be in church but if anybody ought to really be in church it ought to especially be those of us whose skin has been darkened by mother nature's son because everything that we have acquired in this nation uh, has come because of their direct or indirect influence of the church don't you fool yourself it was the church that pricked the conscience of a racist society and pulled down the walls of segregation. And now you are able to work on those jobs, make that money, drive those cars, live in those neighborhoods. But now that some of us have moved on up to the east side and finally gotten our piece of the pie, we act like we don't need to go to church anymore. Shame on you. So the question the Lord sent me to ask you today is this. How high... Can I lift you without losing you? How much can I bless you? And you still recognize that you need me in your life. Paul says, I've been to the university of prosperity. I know what it's like to abound, to increase, and to be full. But I didn't allow even my prospering times to cause me to not believe that I needed God in my life. But wait a minute, 
there's another school that shows up in this same verse. And whereas the first school is the University of Prosperity, I'll call the second school the University of Adversity. Because in that same 12th verse, he not only says, I know how to abound and how to increase, but he also says, I know what it's like to be hungry and to suffer need. That I've been to both ends of the pendulum. That there were times when I've had money in my pocket and food on the table. But life has not been for me no crystal stairs. Because I've been to the university of adversity. Some call it the school of hard knocks. Paul says, I, I know what it's like to be broke and not have a dime in my pocket. He says, I know what it's like to have trouble in my life. That I've been stoned and left for dead. That I've been shipwrecked. I spent a day and a night in the deep. And I know what it's like to be cold and naked and not have sufficient shelter. But Paul reminds us, that no matter what my condition, whether I had plenty of money in my pocket and food on the table, or whether I was broke and didn't have a dime, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Because my sense of happiness does not come from my happening. It comes from my relationship with Christ. I, I have learned. I've learned the secret of contentment. Um, a good friend of mine, Pastor Tellus Chapman, um, tells, tell, told me a story one, time, one day, and now I never will forget it. He said several years ago, he decided that he would take his wife on a bucket list honeymoon, that they would go somewhere that they had never gone before. He decided to take his wife to Hawaii. He said they got to Hawaii, they'd never gone there before. And as they walked down the beach, he said it was such a beautiful, beautiful scenery. Everywhere you looked, he said, it was postcard beauty. The sky was blue and the sun was shining. The birds were soaring on the warm thermal. The foliage was effervescent. The smell, you could smell. It was just beautiful. Children were building sand castles in the sand. Some were holding hands and walking down the beach. Everywhere he turned, he said, it was postcard beauty. But amidst that postcard beauty, he said, I saw something on the beach that didn't look like it belonged there. It was an ugly sight, he said. He said, I saw amid all of that beauty a homeless man who was rummaging through the garbage trying to find something to eat so that he could eke out a meager living for himself. He said, I was arrested by this apparent ugliness amid this postcard beauty. He said, he watched the homeless man intently as he apparently reached into the garbage and got out of the garbage a cold, half-eaten, dirty, germ-infested hamburger. He said he watched that man as he got the burger out the trash. The man sat down on the side, on the curbside, and he began to unwrap the burger. And then the man began to brush off as much dirt and debris that he could from this cold, dirty, half-eaten, germ-infested hamburger. He said, he watched the man, he said, but before the man took a bite, he put his hands together, bowed his head, and he thanked God for the food he was about to receive. He said to his wife, baby, did you see that homeless man? He's thanking God for a half-eaten, cold, dirty, germ-infested hamburger. He said, I've got to do something for him. So he, he ran to the nearest McDonald's, got the man a, a, a burger, some fries, and a Coke, brought the sack and reached it to the, to, to, to the man. The man didn't even look up at him, just reached up and grabbed the sack and got the burger out, started unwrapping it. But before he took a bite, he put his hands together. He bowed his head, and he thanked God for the food he was about to receive. Wait, you're missing it. He was just as thankful 
for a cold, dirty, German-fested burger as he was for one hot off the grill. That homeless man understood what Paul meant when he said, I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. And if a homeless man knows how to thank God for what God has done, surely you and I who have clothes on our backs and a roof over our heads, we ought to stop complaining so much. I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I choose to be happy because my happiness does not come from what I wear, where I live, what I drive, how much money I make. But my happiness comes from knowing that I have a personal Genuine relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the first lesson. That you need to know that your sense of contentment and happiness is in the Savior. But there's just one last movement that I want to share today. And it is this. That if you want to be happy, not only do you need to know that your sufficiency is in the Savior. But you need to know the source of your strength. To be happy. There it is. In verse 13. I can do. All things. Through Christ. Who strengthens me. Now here is one. Of the most misapplied. And misunderstood verses. In all the Bible. Some people use this as a catch all. Almost as an escape mechanism to dealing with the issues of life. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Friend, you know, it's almost like saying you're going to stand out in front of a moving train coming at you at 60 miles an hour. And you standing on the track with your hands up saying, I'm going to stop this train because I can do all things through Christ. You are going to be run over. Whenever you're interpreting a text, you ought to interpret it in light of the context. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It is a participial um, a, a statement. A participle is a verbal adjective that modifies the, the main verb. What has he been talking about? What he's been talking about is I've, I can be content in all my circumstances. How can you do it? Christ strengthening me. Christ strengthening me. In human strength alone, I can't be happy if I don't have the right job, if I don't make the right money, if I don't drive the right car, if I don't live in the right house. But if Christ strengthens me, if Christ pushes me in the back, if Christ energizes me, I can be happy regardless of my circumstances. Now, when you understand that the source of your strength to be happy is in Christ, then you understand, first of all, that you can be positive about your potential. You know, a lot of people don't know the real source of their strength to be happy. Uh, it beca and because of that, friends, they live, they, they, live, they, they, they live with what I call the I can't syndrome, the, that I, I can't be happy. Uh, but, but the Christian life was never meant to be filled with that kind of negativity. No, Christ came to give us uh, a ray of hope amid the darkness of our despair so that on the worst day of your life, when the bottom of life falls out and when Murphy's Law is operative in your life that everything that can go wrong does go wrong, you can still have a sense of contentment if Christ strengthens, empowers, energizes. If he pushes you in the back, you can do it. Are you with me today? But some people, they're just negative, pessimistic. You ever, have you ever met pessimistic people? Negative folk, I mean, just, they, they live like they got a, a perpetual case of the blues. How you doing? Ain't doing well. How you doing? Ain't going well. Listen. A broke clock is right twice a day. I mean, every now and then, something positive ought to come out of your mouth. But when you understand that Christ is the source of your strength, 
to help you, to energize you so that you can have a sense of contentment regardless of your circumstance. Not only does it mean you can be positive about your potential, but it means you can partner with the power of Christ. You see, friends, you can become a part of a dynamic partnership solution to your issues and problems in life. Without Christ in your life, you'll hear people saying, without God, you'll hear people saying, I can't. But you, can ne you will never hear someone truthfully say, God and I can't. Matter of fact, the only time you use can't uh, with God is when you put fail on the end. God can't fail. And yet, and yet there's someone today who's listening to me and said, Pastor, that sounds nice. But man, you don't understand what I'm dealing with. If you understood the circumstances of my life, you'd understand why I say I can't be happy. Am I talking to somebody today that maybe you lost someone close to you to COVID and they're no longer with us now. And you say, Pastor, I can't be happy. Am I talking to somebody today, maybe, maybe this is the first summer or, or, or you're going to face the first fall without a loved one in your life that has passed away. You say, Pastor, with circumstances like that, I can't be happy. Am I talking to somebody today, you say, Pastor, if you only knew what my marriage is really like, that I'm so unhappy, I'm so miserable, that I feel like I have to walk around on eggshells in my own house. Oh, in public, you, you know, you all are fooling people, making people think it's all right, but both of you deserve an Academy Award because the reality is that you're miserable. And you say, Pastor, with a marriage like this, I can't be happy. Somebody said, Pastor, if you knew my financial situation, how jacked up it is, you standing there talking about being happy regardless of your circumstances, man, I don't know how I'm going to get out from under all of this debt you understood my finances, Pastor, you'd understand why I said, I can't be happy. Am I talking to somebody today that because the circumstances of your life are not ideal, you don't feel like you can be happy? It is said that back during the recession we came through about 12 years ago, that a German billionaire, Adolf Merkel, who lost billions, jumped in front of a moving train, he committed suicide. And they tell me even after losing billions, he was still a billionaire. <laughs> what makes billionaires who lose some of their financial portfolio give up on life? Could it be that because the problem is that some people are searching for happiness in all the wrong places? Some turn to the alcohol bottle and say, if I can just get drunk enough, I can pickle, if I can pickle my brains, I'll anesthetize my feelings and I'll be happy if but for a moment. Only to discover that when Jack Daniel wears off, your problem is still there. Others turn to the crack pipe and say, if I can just get high enough, I'll rise above my problems if but for a moment. Only to discover that whatever goes up has to come back down. And when you come back down from your high, your problems are still staring you in the face. Others turn to the shopping mall and say, if I can just buy myself the right St. John knit, if I can buy me some shoes with red bottoms, I'll be happy. Only to discover that 30 days later, you've shopped yourself into a mountain of debt. Others turn to the eating table and eat themselves into bad health. But can I recommend something better than the alcohol bottle, better than the crack pipe, better than the shopping mall? Why don't you turn to Christ? Because real happiness, real contentment, and real joy does not come in what you, what, where you live, what you drive, what you wear, your titles, who you know, the clothes you wear, the money you make. The real sense of happiness comes from knowing that Christ is the source of your strength to be happy regardless of your circumstances. Will you look at your neighbor and tell them happiness is my choice?